Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad studios today. Uh, again, the topic of discussion is about the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. As we all know that uh, the withdrawal was in a haste. A couple of bases were vacated, including the Bagram base, one of the largest in the area. And imagine uh, the number of troops who were stationed there. But interestingly, when that was uh, vacated, Nobody was told that the last uh, C-117 took off from there two hours prior uh, when the Afghan forces got to know. And according to General Khoistani, who is the new commander there, he says that he wasn't taken in confidence, neither he was informed about uh, the uh, last uh, flight. So this is the kind of situation that has developed there. But having said that, the uh, forces, they have been able to get hold of around 1,000 vehicles, including Humvees, including uh, private vehicles, as well as uh, a lot of other equipment, and around 103 million different items, as I also mentioned yesterday. And interestingly, most of the ammunition uh, they have blasted there, and um, other than that, the radars are still there, but other technical uh, sort of a support uh, that the Americans had there, they have taken that along with them. Now, interestingly, uh, when we see uh, the kind of invasions, let me call that an invasion inside invasion, uh, the Taliban are taking over all the northern cities, northern areas in particular, bordering Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and so and so forth. The interesting part now is that uh, this was the area which wasn't a very strong hold of the Taliban. Why are they starting from that area? Another perspective that is very important, what about the future of the Indians? According to the Indian media, there are 3,106 employees who are working there. And most likely a lot of people are from the uh, RAW and other intelligence agencies of India. But having said that, now they are also in a hurry to vacate and leave Afghanistan. That is another development, despite the fact that they have spent over 3 uh, billion US dollars in Afghanistan, making roads, infrastructures, universities, libraries, even the airport, the parliament, and so much more. The interesting part now is that what about the future of these people? What sort of a government will be formed there? And now the Taliban, they have said that after about a day or two, perhaps they will be uh, writing a, a complete detailed format and they'll be handing it over to the government in which they will put their own uh, exact requirements and their own agenda and their own demands. So let's see where it leads. But Afghanistan uh, pull out as far as the foreign troops are concerned, uh, that's over 90% that has been completed. So that's a big number. So before I introduce you uh, to our panelists, let me also uh, tell you about one important area, and that is about the closure of the Tajikistan border as well, because more than 2,000, and according to certain sources, the number could be 3,000 plus. And these were the soldiers who actually ran away, left their checkpoints, and they in fact, entered the Tajikistan side. Now, they will be returning back soon. And the government wants them that they should be back and they should be a part of the forces once again. So what sort of uh, military uh, might uh, the Afghanistan government is looking at? Because these people, they cannot uh, take even the pressure of the presence of Taliban. So how can they fight them, despite whatever sort of an emanation you give them? Let me quickly introduce you to our panelists now. We have with us. In our studio, on my right, is Air Commodore retired Basit Raza Bajsab, who's a senior analyst. So thank you so much for your time. And we also have with us uh, from uh, Washington, D.C., uh, USA, Mariam Vardak. She's an expert uh, on uh, Afghan affairs. She's also a journalist. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mariam Vardak, for your time and for your presence in the show. And we have with us Dr. Shahid Qureshi. He is a senior analyst and is working for the London Post, senior journalist as well, and also a writer. Shahid Sahib, pleasure to have you once more in the show, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Now, sir, the interesting part. Air Commodore Sahib, the Northern Alliance, <coughs> their stronghold, Panshair, and all those areas. You talk about the presence of Rashid Dostum, in the Uzbek side. And remember, 10% of the Afghan population is Uzbek, more than 3 million. And uh, he commands a good number of uh, militia. Now, sir, how come uh, the Afghan uh, government seems to be very weak? Taliban, who were supposed to be weak in that part, 
are gaining strength and so and so uh, forth. Now before uh, I put this question uh, or, or uh, you in fact uh, come up with an answer sir, we have prepared a very interesting report about it. Let's watch that and I think that is surely going to help our viewers also what the situation is like in Afghanistan. Let's have a look. Since the advent of the 21st century, the geopolitical landscape of the world is changing dramatically as China is swiftly engaging the world states through its economic and social interdependent policies under the umbrella of BRI and challenging the United States' hegemonic writ in this regard. The U.S.'s two decades-long military presence in Afghanistan, which facilitated the U.S. to keep a check in South Asia's power arena, is coming to an end. As the withdrawal of American forces from Afghanistan is 90% complete, according to the U.S. Central Command, this pulling out of the U.S. from Afghanistan will make an obvious shift in the power balance in South Asia. China can be an important economic facilitator for war-torn Afghanistan, as it has already expressed its interest in making Afghanistan a part of the CPEC project. On the other hand, China's BRI is synchronizing with Russia's great Eurasian dream, and Russia's concerns regarding transference of Afghanistan originated violence towards its economically vital Central Asian Afghan bordering states. Russia can be a powerful supporter for China to propagate a prosperous Afghanistan. It is a prediction by international political analysts that after the U.S. exit from Afghanistan, the hegemony of the U.S. can have a great setback by a possible merging bloc consisting of Pakistan, China, Russia and most probably Turkey. Pakistan's stance of peaceful Afghanistan will sink in this regard with China and Russia and will strengthen its position in South Asia and will help Pakistan to lead towards what Prime Minister Imran Khan said as civilized and even-handed relations with the United States. On the other hand, the Indian influence in Afghanistan, which is making Afghanistan a safe haven for the anti-Pakistan insurgent groups and facilitating them financially and logistically to spread violence in Pakistan, will also be minimized in this regard. So, sir, this is what the situation is like now, but uh, we'll talk about the role of the regional countries, including China, Pakistan, Russia and Iran, perhaps. But, sir, before that, uh, the philosophy behind uh, the taking over of the northern areas of Afghanistan, sir. What is that supposed to mean? Because according to a lot of analysts, they believe that uh, we were faring, and we still do fear, that a lot of refugees would be coming in um, uh, from these uh, areas South like area. Chaman for that South matter. Area. Or, or, or South side. So, but sir, uh, interestingly, it's the other way around. And these okay. are the areas which do not border Pakistan at all. That's true. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Faisal, they say nothing, nothing succeeds like success. Uh, Taliban, uh, through their determined struggle, have finally uh, achieved their uh, uh, cherished objective, and that was to see the back of uh, the foreign troops from their soil. Uh, and this they achieved almost sing single-handedly. Mm -hmm. th if there was any support, it was only peripheral. They were the ones on the front lines, and they were the ones taking the brunt of the battle for all those decades. So, uh, they have succeeded. They are the victors. You declare them as such or not. So, what they, their morale is sky high. Mm -hmm. And any military strategist, he understands that the morale of a fighting force is of paramount importance. So, with that morale, the, with the high morale, they want to prove to the world their hold on power and their grip on Afghan uh, as a whole country. So they started from north, which is, as you rightly pointed out, is not their stronghold. But they when How come there is no resistance as such? This is because certain areas were captured, certain districts were taken over without firing a single bullet. This is right. And uh, when I said that uh, nothing succeeds like success, then the its counterpart is that nothing fails like failure. Now the, the Afghan <coughs> soldiers, the Afghan army, has been a second fiddle army in all these uh, years. It has been the Americans and the uh, NATO forces which have been planning the missions and executing them. <coughs> Their role was only supporting the Afghan uh, uh, defense forces. They were in a supporting role. Now suddenly that umbrella, <coughs> that leadership which was directing all the uh, military operations is gone and they are left to themselves. So they are unable to find their feet and <laughs> Taliban are actually very strong. They are battle hardened. They have fought all these battles. And very interestingly, Taliban are the master of guerrilla warfare. But now they have entering, entering a phase <coughs> which is not a guerrilla war. It is on the entrenched, established fortresses which they are attacking. 
and with success. And look, they attacked in north and they captured whatever they wanted to capture. They attacked in south, uh, this Kandhar area. Uh, and uh, uh, now they have, uh, today there are news that they have attacked the capital of Badgis pro province, uh, which is Kilano, and there is fight, fighting going on there. So they are showing their dominance and their ascendancy all over Afghanistan. And I am actually, uh, when I think, when I put two and two, Taliban have declared that they are going to uh, give their plan next month. So this 20 or 25 days that we have now, they will actually sort of um, be on the neck, on the throat of all those choke points on those th areas which actually threaten their main cities and uh, uh, these uh, uh, capitals of the provinces. They are not going to actually sort of do much of fighting, I believe, but they will put so much pressure that the Afghan government, which lacks moral value as such, uh, will succumb to that pressure. And perhaps they would come to terms uh, with whatever the Taliban are offering them. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then by that time they will be in a position to actually uh, go for the kill. But they will not straight away go for it because they would prove to the world <coughs> that we are still looking for a political solution mm -hmm. because that is what they uh, signed in Doha. And please see that to date, Taliban have not violated an iota of any clause of Doha agreement. They are still sticking to it. And that is what the basis of this, all this, uh, uh, what's going on mm -hmm. is the base of that. All right. So this is what is happening and the, we have interesting time ahead. Interesting time, sir. People believe that it could lead to a civil war. Rather, the civil war is already <coughs> on and uh, a lot is going on and let's see how the media reports about it since the Western world is uh, not present as such in Afghanistan, but uh, a lot is happening. Now, coming to you, uh, Mario Vardik, since uh, you uh, are an expert on Afghan affairs based in Washington, First of all, two perspectives. What exactly Washington is thinking at the current situation? And secondly, what is your take on this development which we have witnessed during the last uh, 15 days or so? And a, a lot of people believe that the situation is going to remain very fluid for another four to six weeks and things would be a little clear that uh, what sort of a direction uh, the current government is going to take or perhaps the Taliban, uh, are they going to be in a dictating condition or what? Your take, ma'am. Intriguing questions. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'd like to give you guys a bit of a scenario of what's happening on the ground in Kabul. You have a huge change, a transition in leadership, especially in the military. You had the Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Defense, Minister of Defense, and Chief of Army Staff all removed and new individuals brought in. That has obviously brought some sort of instability to our Afghan National Defense Security foot soldiers who are there battling. So when earlier when you had mentioned there was a communication back, uh, gap between the forces leaving Bagram bases and other bases and not informing, informing the Afghan National Defense Security Forces, I think that that comes from that gap because there isn't as much of a trust mechanism uh, there, especially since they are exiting the fact of not rebuilding uh, a sort of relationship with the current, uh, administ uh, the current placed uh, individuals. That's where the... Uh, the misinformation uh, gap is continuing to grow. A second aspect of it is the last former um, chief of army staff, Yasin Zia, was someone who was fighting along his soldiers, going to each border, going to each battleground and fighting amongst them. This current Afghan uh, chief of army staff is not applying the same mechanism. So of course, the Afghan National Defense Security Forces are confused. What are they confused about? At one point, we are fighting these people for the past 20 years with the help of our international forces. Now, we are supposed to be at a, t uh, at a time at negotiation, but our fighting still prevails. So there is that confusion. And on top of that, you have President Ghani, who is sending a delegation who is at a, uh, at a complete stop in Doha, but he is advocating and communicating war everywhere. When he was here recently on his trip with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, his National Security Advisor, and his other close aides, he was dis he, his narrative was all war. Very little was their peace discussions. And I heard that behind closed door, he had requested Biden's administration to 
um, extend their their departure because Biden's administration was completely re to withdraw by July 4th, although the narrative in the beginning was by September 11th. So there is a lot of confusion. There is a distrust amongst the administration. But Biden has a history of distrust, distrust with the Afghan administration. And this had initiated when Karzai was the president of Afghanistan and when Biden, uh, President Biden at that time was vice president Biden to the Obama administration. He had created a huge gap amongst both the administration at that time. I'm not sure what Biden's um, personal view is on Afghanistan, but it's quite clear that he has no interest to stay in that country because he was one of the advocates to reduce the troops, the 40,000 troops that were reduced, I think, on June, uh, January 24th um, during the uh, Obama administration. So I think that was first Biden's first victory to inform the Afghan Taliban that we are going to eventually leave, be patient. Now we have to look at the perspective that the Afghan Taliban are Afghans. At the end of the day, the Afghan people need to come to some sort of agreement amongst one another. Are the Afghan Taliban uh, applying a good methodology? I don't, Mariam, know. If I don't I may, think if so. If I may the, intervene the, here, because in Pakistan there is a lot of confusion. What sort of a society uh, exists in Afghanistan? Obviously, like in Pakistan, we have got four provinces. Sindh is different from Punjab. Punjab is different from Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, that is slightly uh, different from Balochistan. But, you know, out there, do you believe that the Taliban, they have a lot of uh, uh, ground support in the form of, um, you know, people really, you know, looking forward uh, to them, you know, uh, coming over and taking over? Or people like you and me, for that matter, who live in the cities, are they ready for that kind of a Sharia, the tribal Muslim Sharia I'm talking about? Uh, what about those 42% girls who go to school, uh, for that matter, or universities or colleges? I mean, we believe in Pakistan that, you know, it is a total tribal society. Perhaps every man wears a turban and carries a Klashenkov there. And perhaps every single woman is in a burqa. I mean, let's clear that part. Yes, of course. What I about mean, the future question. of these semi-liberal people? Do they exist there? I the Afghan community is quite diverse, and I think that we need to be very clear in understanding the cultural aspect of it. See, Kabul is very disconnected from the rest of Afghanistan because of the foreign influence, because of the, uh, the presence of the international community. As that lessens, the freedom and the, uh, the uh, uh, accessibility to, of movement is going to be limited. <coughs> Kabul is much more free in regards to access to education, access to entertainment, etc. But when you step outside of Kabul, if you go to Herat, which is one of our most cultural and progressive poet poetic uh, historical sites, they're very conservative. They do not wear a burqa, but they wear a black abaya that covers pretty much everything from head to toe. When you go to mazar sharif when you go to Balkh, it's also a very conservative society. Kandahar is also a very conservative society. So outside of Kabul, going about 20 miles out to Wardak province, where I'm from, they are also, they do not wear burqas, but they dress uh, um, conservative to their province. So in okay. Wardak, it's a huge black scarf where half of your face is covered and you wear a, a large uh, skirt. And in other places, it's complete <clears throat> black from head to toe. So these are, these are the clients. There are burqas, and burqas are when people are traveling amongst the provinces because they are afraid of the Afghan Taliban. Are Taliban welcomed by the Afghan people? Taliban have put in historical fear amongst the Afghan people, but they also know the language of tribalism. And tribalism is a prominent aspect of the Afghan culture, especially when you step outside of Kabul. We are a tribal society. But there is a modern take to tr tribal society. One thing that th I think that we all need to be aware of and we need to communicate this is that the Afghan Taliban are not the same uh, foot soldiers that they were about 20 years ago, but the Afghan society are also not the same people that they were 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. They're, the Afghan public witnessed war. They were exhausted. They just wanted the end to war. They had no access to education, no access to economic opportunities. But today, all right. it's a different story. You have educated two mm. decades of young people who know what it is to be empowered. Now, that and is a Afghan very Taliban important factor because when you talk about the demographics, Mariam, I think that is going to be the key factor 
and obviously when we look at the overall demographics of the region, a lot of people are young and full of energy and they want to do something, looking forward for a better future. So I think that is going to be a very important point where I'll just take the debate uh, towards my other friend uh, from uh, London, uh, Dr. Shahid Qureshi Saab. Shahid Saab, first of all, sir, your take um, on the current situation. And since, you know, uh, uh, I keep on um, looking at the interviews you, you send me and I just go through most of those uh, articles as well that you have written. So I can understand the kind of uh, mindset uh, which you believe prevails in Afghanistan. But sir, now looking at the current situation, a lot is happening too quickly and we did not even know. And secondly, sir, earlier before the program, I was sitting with uh, Air Commodore Basit and we were just having a word that uh, why and how come all this is happening? What would be the future of the current Afghan government? Ashraf Ghani is not ready uh, for the new elections or something, but you know, the kind of demand that is going to be there by the Taliban might have this particular uh, agenda or point there as well that, you know, you need to uh, focus on the election or uh, step down or something of that sort. Tell us about it. Well, thank you for having me and uh, thank you for uh, reading my articles. And re I was doing a program on NBC two days ago, and uh, and uh, and I see this uh, this this habit in the Western society, especially the Americans. They go into micromanaging that what kind of dress the Afghans people were wearing. What kind of Afghan women will be looking like? It's none of your business. The U.S. gun lobby is the most armed and influential lobby who's caused more deaths in the United States than any wars. The, the crime rate in the USA, every 60 seconds, you have women is raped. Every two minutes, a man is murdered, the burglaries. I'm talking about the FBI data here. I've done this report. So when you have your so much troubles and, and the U.S. Uh, infrastructure is so much damaged, the build, the bridges, the roads, that it needs about 1.5 trillion or more to rebuild that infrastructure, which nobody looked at in the last 20 years. So U.S. has uh, a lot of reconstruction to do when they have a lot of, uh, they have done a lot of destructions in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in all those countries. In those, these are Muslim lands. Okay, so now come to the to, to Afghanistan uh, government. I, I mean, when I see, look at uh, uh, this Ashraf Ghani, um, he, is, he will go and live somewhere in Lebanon with his uh, Christian wife. Uh, there's no issue around for him. He's a guest. Uh, something we call it pigs. Pigs mean uh, uh, permanently invited guests. So these are the guests we, uh, the Afghans had for the last 20 years, and they're going to go. And the, the, the fundamental mistake with the U.S. administration did was they did not include the whole of uh, uh, Afghan representation in the government they were supporting. Northern Alliance is a very small part. I Iran was supporting Northern Alliance. India was supporting Northern Alliance. And so was the United States. And these uh, people of uh, Afghanistan who were resisting, I won't name them as Taliban, or it was a resistance by the people like same like in Vietnam. We should trust their intelligence because these people, after all, has beaten up the most sophisticated superpower in the world. We need, we shouldn't underestimate their intelligence and uh, and their uh, management structure. They do have management structure. They have been taking money from the French uh, troops. They've been taking money from the British troops. They were Italian. And they were giving them receipts every month, and that was the money which they were paying for protection. Uh, the the uh, over 38 billion dollar worth of uh, drugs have been produced in last 20 years, which was actually running this war, and that happened because of the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. And uh, about 30 or more percent was also going to Taliban in terms of fueling this war. So these factors. I mean, I I will be very offended if, that if I will be discussing what kind of dress a woman in Harat is wearing or in Kabul or in uh, 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 Panjshir, a woman. This is the reason I asked this question is, sir, uh, uh, Kureish saab, religion. the reason why I, I had asked this question to Mariam was uh, because the whole world is now talking about the women rights. People believe that the well, ideology of Taliban, it has changed over the last two decades or so. Now they won't be yeah, hitting uh, anyone, uh, you know, wearing um, heels that produce some sort of a noise or sound while walking. You know, this is the kind of stories that what we have heard. 
Perhaps the media has also sort of maligned the overall image of Afghanistan. But Kuresa, these are the facts that are, you know, based on realities. And then the Western world forms their narrative on such, uh, you know, sort of issues. That was the reason, sir. These are, these are twisted facts which your media in Pakistan buy it very quickly. I did a story on Sharmeen Chinoy's uh, uh, so-called Oscar she received four years ago. And it took four years for a DG Rangers to realize that Pakistan was already number four, unfortunately, in asset attacks. And guess which country was number one? England. The country where I am sitting. Exactly. That, that was number one in asset attacks. Uh, let's not talk about the, uh, uh, the, the issue uh, it's it's their people. They have been fighting for the last 20 years, and we can, we have no right to criticize or judge. And we let the people decide what they want to wear, what decide what they what kind of education they want to have. We should know that these people are victorious. They have beaten this most sophisticated superpower who left the country without informing its host. Northern Ally Afghani government, Ghani administration was the host of the USA. They left without even telling them that actually we are going. So what, what Sir, kind they of came in without are? telling Afghan government. They went out without telling the Afghan government because it really doesn't matter to them. United States of America, at the end of the day, does, whether we like it or yes, we don't, is does, a superpower. No, it does matter that what kind of culture, what kind of mindset you are, and that was the thing we have been talking in in London for that why the U.S. is failing to understand the Afghan culture, the Afghan people. They use Afghanistan as a testing ground. They use their live weapons of, on human beings. They use the biggest bomb on the human beings. This is what they did in the last 20 years. They used Afghan as a... And I agree that was a testing uh, ground, indeed. Test Mother of all bombs, I remember. And so much more. Look what happened in Tura Bura. And the interesting the part of that whole <laughs> philosophy was... Beyond and beyond, uh, beyond imagination, the atrocities the, the Americans have committed in Afghanistan, the Australians and the other soldiers are beyond imagination. There's no court of law which can... Sir, can, there are can, horror can, stories can, can, coming in from right. Bagram base. Uh, horror stories, you know, we've been reading about Guantanamo. The point is, sir, at the end of the day, America, whether you talk about the White House, you talk about the State Department, I mean, the role of Pentagon, CIA... That is what matters the most. Coming to you, Grace now a couple of very important uh, issues. One is that um, uh, the Russian foreign minister stated that they will be operating their uh, base or activating their base in Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, maybe they really want to keep an eye that there should be no influx, number one. And secondly, sir, the reason uh, why the Taliban seem to be that strong in that part, is it because of some sort of a support coming in from the Russians, sir? Because they were engaged at a very early stage, sir, with the Russian government as far as negotiations are concerned. And nobody, in fact, denied that at time. Neither no anybody accepted it. Mm -hmm. So now it seems that there was this equation, and it was there for a very long time. Uh, they have been covertly uh, uh, helping Taliban. This is known. And uh, they're they actually, America was looking for a, a foothold uh, in the surrounding area, uh, which they didn't get it. Pakistan refused and the other countries, the Central Asian countries also refused that. Uh, so uh, now Russia's presence actually is a sort of uh, indication that uh, they are also there and they are watching the things. So uh, I see it that way. And uh, uh, I uh, take a cue from the comment of uh, 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 Mariam, uh, what he talked about that there's a lot of propaganda against Taliban and I think about their views and how they are going to handle. And I think Taliban have also matured and uh, they are different from what they were uh, uh, two decades back. So I think we should not have any uh, issue on that and uh, we should just wait and see how they uh, tackle that situation. Uh, the other part is the uh, game of the regional powers which is Russia and China uh, you mentioned. But there are other players like Iran, uh, Pakistan is uh, actually uh, interacting with them. So it is the uh, sort of role of regional powers uh, is also now accentuated because the main vacuum created by the Americans uh, 
so uh, these powers have their own interest like uh, just came out that China uh, is actually looking for stability in this area because the CPEC and other they have their uh, own economic interests simple exactly. as that so so they, 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 are, they will be having a sobering influence mm -hmm. I mean the the, the, uh, the foreign forces which have gone uh, I think we can hope for better days ahead and we let's watch the things uh, patiently and I don't see uh, things going out of uh, proportion. This is my uh, own reading. A lot of analysts believe that there is going to be a civil war-like situation, sir, because the uh, current government of Ashraf Ghani really want that uh, there should be a proper offensive launched on the Taliban uh, troops, or group, as we call it. Actually, you can desire for anything, but do you have the wherewithal? Do you have the soldiers to deliver that? Of course, Americans have given you equipment and training and everything, but the Afghan Defense Forces, as I said again, they have been playing a second fiddle. And all the operations that they were going, they were actually told what to do. And now that they have to decide... The commitment to isn't there. The will isn't there. there. It's not there. They mm -hmm. were actually... Uh, it was better opportunity for them, better economic opportunity for them to be part of uh, these forces. Mm -hmm. uh, not out of motivation, uh, real motivation. Uh, or anything. It's, it was more of a sort of necessity that they joined these forces. And that's why you see so many desertions. That's why you see the soldiers leaving their post. Because there's no inner motivation. And a soldier without inner motivation uh, doesn't fight. Does, uh, he looks for the The one who is being runner. killed is also saying Allahu Akbar. The one who is killing is also saying Allahu Akbar. So I fail to understand who's right, who's wrong here. That's right. And uh, my, I, I, uh, my only view is that the Taliban are actually uh, capturing areas of uh, tactical Str strategic, strategic importance, importance. Mm. and they were uh, they are going to exert an overbearing pressure which will be too 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 much for uh, Mr. Ashraf Ghani to sort of uh, sustain and tolerate and uh, I think uh, he's not going to last long under this situation if similar uh, episodes of soldiers deserting their posts and uh, uh, walking into other countries or uh, going back to the more protected areas. If this trend continues, then uh, there won't be too much of uh, fighting also. This is what I see. Uh, my feeling is that this is what Taliban are playing, uh, planning, that with minimum use of force, they want to capture those key areas from where they can exert an overbearing pressure and force the enemy or the opposing party to sort of agree to the peace plan that they have prepared and they will pre uh, present uh, next week, next month. The strengthening of Taliban in that region, or perhaps at some stage taking over Afghanistan and forming a government, is that good news for Pakistan? What is your take on that? Uh, actually, uh, Taliban, uh, we have previous associ association with them uh, when they, they were in uh, government. Uh, we were the one of the three countries who recognized them. Although uh, we didn't sort of uh, maintain that uh, uh, diplomatic decorum which was required uh, in the end. So uh, that's history that's passed. And now <coughs> Taliban are sort of uh, not only dependent on Pakistan. They have uh, gone o all over the world. They have been to Russia, they have been to Iran. And they have even uh, talked to the Indian foreign minister, or he has talked to them. <coughs> <coughs> so they are more mature, and uh, it depends how Pakistan now treats them. We have our legacy relationship, uh, which has been up and downs in yeah. that. And at the moment, what we do now is very important. We have been sort of at times, we have been too, uh, uh, we have been trying to play a role. Uh, which Americans wanted us to play. And whatever happened during the Musharraf's regime, yes. do you think all that, uh, I won't call it misunderstanding, uh, I would call it uh, betrayal in one way. Do you think that is going, that, that effect or that image or that perception is going to get eroded at some stage? Actually, Taliban, uh, this leadership of Taliban at least, I am talking of the political uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. I think they are generous people. The way... Uh, it's a very sad episode of our history. I don't want to sort of talk about it. Uh, the way we uh, sort of treated the ambassador, mm -hmm. 
Zarif, Ambassador Zarif. And Zarif and all these guys. And still they came back to Pakistan when they, 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 they were a peace negotiation. Sir, honestly so speaking, you, need to, you need to actually read what happened to him because I was told by one of the person who in fact was a part of that group who handed him over. And he said that I was feeling so ashamed that what they were doing. I mean, the, the way they took off his clothes and the way he <laughs> was carried. And I mean, but obviously, these are the bad moments so of Faisal history. This but that's a reality. This was my point, that this is what our relationship had been with Taliban. That sometimes we were fighting with them side by side. And on the other we side. We never got to know. We obviously, we do not understand what, what is the future of the TTP, which the Afghan government believes that uh, it doesn't even exist. Exactly. But still, there are so many attacks on the Pakistani soldiers on our uh, checkpoints on our men in uniform for that matter. So let me also now go to uh, Marim a couple of questions for you. First of all, <coughs> as far as India is concerned, do you believe that, uh, because uh, I, I was going through a lot of Indian channels on, on, um, on the internet, and they seemed pretty, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I would say like confused what exactly is going on in Afghanistan, and they always consider the Taliban as Pakistan's favorites. And now they are fleeing, fleeing out of uh, Afghanistan. And perhaps if the Taliban, they take over, let's Im imagine maybe in two months, three months, four months, or by the end of this year, uh, what sort of a message that would be for the Indians? Do you think they will renegotiate their terms and conditions to be in India, uh, be in Afghanistan, or perhaps their role is going to diminish? Or perhaps their role is going to get a little transparent as far as Pakistan is concerned because we believe and we have the proof and we know that Afghan soil unfortunately is being used against Pakistan by the Indians. Mariam? There's so many guerrilla warfares happening on the Afghan ground that I don't think it's fair for any of us to point fingers. And one of the aspects that I want to jump on in the discussions that you guys were having is the fact that Afghan Taliban have no loyalty to any country and they don't even have loyalty to their own Afghans, which is what's going to cause a lot of distress in the future. And the possibility of a civil war is very strong because of the fact that they do not care for Afghan lives. The way they are behaving, the vultural aspects, you cannot take an educated individual and try to live, uh, live in a barbaric uh, life. And the Afghan Taliban have become sophisticated in the sense of using modern technology, using television. So I don't think that they're going to operate in the way that they had. But the fact that they want to continue to instill fear amongst the Afghan people is why they come to make themselves seem like monsters. In regards to India, India has had a very soft approach when it comes to interacting with Afghanistan and the Afghan people. And I think that their engagement with the Afghan people will always continue, whether the Afghan Taliban are coming into a transitional government or not. The type of approach that they have and the importance of the relationship that has been built amongst them. You see, when it comes to Pakistan, Pakistan has always played the silent card in, in their engagement with Taliban until recent revelations when it came mm -hmm. to uh, their engagement with the Taliban. This is what has caused distrust in some aspects. Now that we're talking about it so openly and there is clarity on the aspect, this is where the Taliban should, the, uh, the Pakistan should have more of a push to how the Taliban are for, uh, moving forward, but they don't. And this goes back to our engagements and how unstable in this region will be. The threat to Pakistan, the threat to India, the threat to other regional countries such as China will be present and very strong. We cannot uh, ignore the fact that there are 22 active terrorist groups in Afghanistan. And they're, act they're active because of the aspect of criminal activity. Now, we should not give Taliban as much power as they seem. It's not Taliban that's exhausting the Afghan National Defense Security Forces. It's actually criminal activity that's on the rise. And why is criminal activity on the rise? It's because of the lack of economic opportunities to the Afghan people. Second, quick comment. And since you talked about the 22 active groups that include Tariq Taliban Pakistan, IS, ISIS, Daesh, yes, you yes. talk about Hezbollah Erar, Hezbollah Tehri, you talk about so many. Uh, other groups for that matter. But uh, do you think that uh, their approach towards Pakistan, that needs to change? Will it be changed? Are you talking about the terrorist groups or are you talking about yes. the Afghan Taliban? All these non-state actors present in Afghanistan. 
I'm not sure. I cannot speak on their behalf, but I think that it's going to be a threat to all of the neighboring countries. It's not going to be any sort of change. If anything, I think it's going to get quite violent. All right. Now, the closing remarks from you, uh, Qureshi Saab, especially about these non-state actors that are present there. And we do fear and we do believe that uh, the Indian support is there for them, financial support, material support, and otherwise, whatever is happening, eventually we all end up getting all the evidence against them, especially the Indians and the Afghan, even well, NSA seems to be involved. Well, the, the evidence was always there. And I think I, I must say that, that I, I really, uh, really feel what Musharraf did to the uh, Afghan ambassador was a very shameful act and he should be ashamed of himself. That you do not do this on behalf of the Americans. Uh, who, are, who have no respect for human being or humanity in the last 20, 30 years. We saw in Fallujah, in, uh, in, in the Guantanamo, and the rest of the part of the world. Let's come to the uh, Afghan uh, terrorist group, which uh, Mariam has mentioned. I would like to invite you to read the Brzezinski Doctrine. What was the Brzezinski Doctrine was that they will always, I mean, CIA will always, have, or U.S. will always have a, uh, have a group of individuals uh, religious individual, religiously motivated individual, which will be working in the interest of the United States. And that's why the ISIS and the AISH and TTP and all these groups, basically, if you go deep down their, uh, their origin and their, uh, uh, how they function, then you will realize that there will be some uh, CIA funding backing behind, uh, as it was in the Southern American states. We see that uh, the U.S. is supporting uh, uh, the Shias in uh, Iraq, uh, but the same U.S. is supporting the Sunnis in uh, uh, in Syria against the uh, so so that, so that is uh, something which we need to uh, to understand how U.S. actually functions. That U.S. is the most damaging friends in last 40, 50 years. In we saw in our last time, how is it treating Turkey? Four million refugees. How treated Pakistan? Three point five million refugees, and now it left without even a solution. We have Blackwater contractors. We have mercenaries in Afghanistan, and I think those people, uh, those groups uh, which uh, were mentioned before, they will be uh, tackled uh, by the Russians, by the Chinese, Pakistanis, Iran, and I think these regional countries has to join in uh, to eliminate those groups. Or, or have some kind of uh, negotiations or, 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 or any kind of solution which will, will be seems appropriate. Like with regards to the TTP or TTP, uh, Afghan soil was used under the American nose against Pakistan. The, the, the Salala Chok post attack on the Pakistan military, that was done under the US and NATO forces. And these were the things which were happening to the Pakistani, 70,000 people were killed as a result of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. Nobody invited the United States to come to Afghanistan. U.S. came its own with the false pretenses that the Afghanistan was responsible for the 9-11 attacks. But nobody has actually questioned that how come your 15 intelligence agencies with billions of dollars budget totally failed to totally foresee uh, these attacks coming and in terms of the accountability, nobody was held responsible for this yeah. failure. They held respond. They said that you were having this guy and that guy had this on Pakistani soil. But nobody has actually ever questioned the Pentagon, the CIA, the FBI that why did you fail all these uh, attacks on your soil and you got your 3,000 people killed? I asked this question because in, sir, uh, Afghan invasion was planned much prior to 9/11. Simple as that, and you know that, and I know that. I and agree it wasn't Al Qaeda. They were looking after. <laughs> it wasn't Taliban. Primarily, they wanted to be in that area to control the Russians and the Chinese and their expansion plan. Simple as that. Anyway, sir, thank you so much for your participation in the show. Mariam, it was a pleasure to have you in the show, and we'll definitely keep on having you in the future as well. And Basa, always good to see you in the show, sir. Thank you so much. And that's all we have for this, sir. I'll see you tomorrow, inshallah. Thank you.